All right. How is everybody? Second service. Oh, wow. This seems a little bit rowdier than normal. Do you notice that? It, it's kind of exciting, you know? Not that you're not, you know, very spiritual and love Jesus, but for some reason there's like an extra vibe of, of uh, pumped up in here. Um, we're in the return series. We just made it through the first service, and um, I need to tell you that we are going to be talking about prayer. Um, if you have not, if you weren't here last week, last week was amazing. I know that you guys all know I love Derek, blah, 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 blah. You think it's getting old, but I really, last week he was talking about returning to worship, and he said some things that were just so profound, and I thought I can't, I couldn't stop thinking about them all week. If you missed last week, you need to go listen to it. It was awesome, and I'm going to refer to a couple of things that, uh, that Derek said that kind of spurred my, my uh, message this morning on prayer. Um, but it was weird. I mean, I was anxious last night. I could not sleep. I, I was thinking about how inadequate I am to get up here and tell everybody in the room to return to prayer. When prayer, I wasn't really praying that much before. Like, I did pray some, but it's not like it was this part of my life that I was, like, pursuing. Yeah, I was Christian and all that stuff, but I wasn't, like, it wasn't, like, a big part of what I did, you know? And the more I thought about it last night, I was like, you know, Maybe I'm the wrong person to get up here and tell everybody, return to prayer. But then I thought more about, like, you know, all of us. You know, like, we just went through something crazy with the pandemic. Um, and it's like, how many people did you hear say they pursued prayer, a time of prayer during all this extra free time that we had? Um, I, bra- I bragged a lot about my wife in the first service, and I'm going to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Points for myself. Uh, no, just kidding. Sarah is one of the few people. We've been married 20 years. Sarah is one of the few people. Yes, uh, it's amazing she stayed with me this long. I'm a lot, if you can't tell. Um, but she's one of the few people that have, like, her disposition has always been to pray first. And I think she gets a lot of it from her mother. Her mom is like that. But, you know, me, crazy, fly-off-the-handle guy, I'm always like, oh, my God. You know, I freak out about little stuff like, my wallet, oh, like, it's a wallet, it's somewhere, keys, ah! I'm trying to pull out hair I don't have, and it's just keys, and she'll literally just let me go crazy and be like, uh, have you prayed? And I'm like, no, why the heck would I pray about keys? That's weird, you know? No, but it's not, she's good. But even, even through, like, hard things, Sarah's like, and she prays like it's always been a part of her spirituality, like she, she, it's, it's been a part of her life. Sarah is one of the few people, and this is a true confession, that's something very special about her. She's one of the few people that I personally know in my life that has dedicated time with certain friends where they just get together and pray, and they've done it for years. It's amazing. That's the way we should be. I want to be like Sarah, and she has pretty hair. And her human smell is awesome. I love it. <laughs> Dude, it really is. All right, this isn't a sermon about Sarah. Yeah, she's great. I'm married to her. Uh, this is a sermon about uh, prayer. Um, so I want to read a scripture. So I told you Derek, Derek made some statements, and I'm going to refer to him. But we're, I, was, I was scheduled to speak to the youth this last Wednesday, and we're, we're going through a series with the youth called, and it's the book of Ephesians. So we're going through all, all the chapters. And I was on Ephesians 2. So I want to read this. Uh, this has kind of been, this will be where we, this will be our pivot point for everything that we say today is these verses. So let's read together. Ephesians 2, but God, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ when we were dead in transgression, trans, I can't say that word. I couldn't do it in the first service either. Transgressions, yes. Um, it is by grace you have been saved. And these, this verse and the next one is what really got me. And God raised us up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And the incomparable riches of his grace, when I read that, I immediately thought about what Derek said last week when he was talking about worship as a weapon and a means of grace. It's like a way we can fight against the things that we deal with in this world and I, I'm, th- I'm literally thinking about riches and, and, and incomparable and, and his grace. Like it's so much bigger than just saying only that we've been saved by grace. Like God wants to, he's this great king who loves us and he's, he's, he's raised us up out of our sin and our inability to come near him. And he just wants to, like a good king, he wants to just give us 
grace and riches and weapons. There's so much more to his grace than just, oh yeah, God is good and graceful, right? If you have never heard the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, second, in, in that book, there, you've ever heard of King David? Yeah, everybody's heard of him. Uh, king David, before him, the, he, King David was the second king. It's King Saul. King Saul hated David, right? And, and he... He knew he was going to be the successor. It's, you got to go read all the stories. It's crazy. But uh, eventually, Saul dies. King, David becomes king, and he, David cre- creates one of the greatest kingdoms in Israel's uh, history. The, the, the coolest part about this story in 2 Samuel is David's best friend was named Jonathan, and he was the son of Saul. And after Saul died and David becomes king, like, Anyone in Saul's lineage and family, their name is like mud. Nobody, they're, they're being eradicated. They tried to kill the great King David. Everybody hates his guts, right? Well, Jonathan had a son, and his son was a cripple. Not only was he a cripple, he was of the line of the most hated family in, uh, in, in Israel. And uh, in the story, you see, you see David send his servants to go and get the cripple. He gets the cripple, and he comes, and it's, the Bible says he sits him at the table with the king. And we're the cripple, right? Like people have preached sermon on, we're the cripple. Like we literally have nothing to offer God. We can't even get ourselves up off the ground. And he comes and he's raised us up out of the place we were and set us next to who? The king. The king. And what does a king have? He has riches. And Jesus longs to bestow on us riches of grace and give us weapons of warfare to fight. This is Jesus. This is what he's like. This is where the... The great exchange happens, right? The cross. Derek, again, last week he talked about Jesus reading a prophecy about himself where he says he longs to give us beauty for ashes. Like we're cripples. Everything we have is just ashes. And when we come to him like cripples, he wants to make this exchange where he takes all the ashes and he gives us his beauty. What is his beauty? Have you ever pondered in your heart what that might mean for you? Beauty for ashes. This is the great exchange these are pretty words, I know. I, I know how to make them sound very poetic, but let's be honest. Prayer is not easy. Prayer is hard, right? Except for, for Sarah. Sarah is so holy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it is. You know, like we know we should pray. We're Christians. Uh, we know we should be pursuing prayer, but it's hard, why is it hard? It's not, if, if it was easy, everybody would be doing, but it's not something that you hear people consistently saying they're doing, right? I didn't pursue prayer during the pandemic, but you know what I did pursue? Fishing. Oh my gosh, we had all this extra free time fishing. I went and got a kayak for, from a buddy brand new, and I was like, you know, I'm going to be a real Jacksonville redneck. I'm going to catch fish. Uh, and I'm going to like take pictures of them. I don't have social media, but I'm going to have Sarah like have me with my big fish and I'm get one of my buddies to show me how to cut it up. We're going to eat it. I'm going to like provide them with my family during the pandemic with fish. Like I thought all this crazy stuff. And every time like I was, I just got into this thing and I'm like, I got a kayak and I asked every good fisher I know, like where you go, don't ask fishermen how to fish. Every single one of them tells you something completely different. Oh, high tide, yeah. Low tide, oh, yeah. Never go at high tide, yeah. And like, oh, use this bait, catch them every single time. Go at this time of day, fish there. Dude, you got to figure it out yourself. They're liars. Because they don't want you to catch the fish. They're their fish, you know. But I had this expectation. Man, I got my cooler. Oh, every time I open the cooler, I put the ice in there. You know why? Because I'm putting a fish in there. I'm putting a fi- every, I like went 15 times to Dutton Island, Oak Harbor, and I'm, every, the first four times I'm just walking into B&M like, what's up, I need some ice, so I'm going to put a fish in there, and whatever new bait you guys got, because the other four times it didn't work. Every time, ice, but get my expect each time I go out there, nothing, 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 and Asher, my oldest, he's 19, he's always been into fishing, he's been out there, and he started to be like, oh, dad, you're never going to catch anything, you're never going to catch anything, and I'm like, I was very disappointed with Asher, (laughs) he had no faith in me at all, he was like, and I wanted to remind him, yes, he's a good fisherman, but he hasn't always been Mr., hey, I catch all the fish, when my children were little, we lived on, in San Pablo, on this neighborhood, was a giant pond out in front of it, the villages of Pablo, anybody heard of it, man, we spent I mean, hours at this pond catching these fish. Uh, when all my kids were little, a lot of my neighbor kids would, would be with us. Lots of our, our, our friends as kids spent time at this pond. 
and uh, the, Kaylee and Sadie uh, were there a lot. And we first got Kennedy. If you don't know Kennedy, he's my adopted son from Uganda. This one particular story, he was like, he'd only been living with us with a month, and we were going to go show Kennedy how, to, how we fish over here in the USA, you know, and the kids are all excited. Um, and we're like, hey, you know, and he couldn't speak very good English. Uh, but Sadie, I want to show you a picture. This is Sadie's Instagram, my youngest baby. Uh, Kaylee just turned 16 years old, and this is Sadie's post. Look at my baby girls. You see their little boots and their hairs? They're my favorite things. Way more than my sons. No, just kidding. I love them so much. But that's the spot. And I mean, we caught some fish there. But the first time we took Kennedy there, they're so adorable. Here's the thing I just thought about. I always see them like that, even though they look like that. They're grown. Like when you're, you grow up, you only see yourself as yourself, but your parents always see you looking like that, you know? God, I shouldn't have thought of that. What a cry. You're my babies. So anyway, we're on, we're on the thing, and Asher is just like Sarah, looks just like her, calm, cool, collected, it's totally he's got a fish on. And he's standing there, and there's Kennedy, and boom, fish on, and he's like, oh, oh, I got one, and he's all excited, and the girls are like, yay, Asher, oh, and Kennedy's just standing there, like, all happy, and uh, Asher gets it up to the surface, and guess what, not fish, big, dirty boat, boot. <laughs> Kennedy looks at it, and Kennedy has a big smile, great laugh, and he literally just goes, ha, ha, nice fish. And he, it's, that sounded a little bit like Borat. We didn't show him Borat when he came here. I don't know who Borat is. I don't watch that stuff. I'm a pastor. That's jokes are terrible. Um, yeah, but, you know, I'm thinking about it, and this, I feel like sometimes we view prayer as like fishing. Like we get our stuff, and we got expectation. We're throwing the line out into the ocean of grace, right? And God is going to come through, and I'm just going to keep, God's going to give, I'm praying nothing. Let me do it again. Let me do it again. And over and over, we go to God in prayer, and sometimes it feels like, what am I doing? I'm casting and I'm getting nothing. Or if you do get something, it's just a dink. That's all I caught. 15, 15 times out there, I caught a redfish like this big. I was trying to hold it back in the boat so I could make the, like, take the picture, make it look as huge as I could. Nothing. Oh, that's all I got. And sometimes it's like, God, you, this, is, this is all I'm getting when I pray? Or sometimes you don't even get anything like you expected. You get like a dirty boot. It's like, God, really? You know, like, is this how it is? Or, you know what I'm saying? Or is it like text messages? Last night, my dad texted me. He's going through something really difficult and asked me to pray. I didn't pray. I just said, I'll pray. Keep me posted. Is that how our prayer lives is with God? We just, we're just updating him with things that are going on, and he's just like, keep me posted. Yeah, like, like, is he hearing the prayers, you know? Does it matter when we pray? Does he care that I'm making a petition and I'm requesting something from him? Is that what Christianity is or is it not? Can we not go to God? Does he not care? Or is, or is prayer more than just getting our, our, our requests met? What if the point is not just that he answers prayer, but that we are going near to him, that we're going close to him? We just went through the series on Acts the book of Acts. 52 times in the book of Acts, the Holy Ghost is mentioned. 40 times prayer is mentioned. So there's a connection, right? When we pray, you can see it in the pages of of Acts that God comes, that things, things begin to change. We know there's a connection. We know we should pray, but chronically, modern Christians are deficient in prayer. Now, why? I mean, I pondered this. Prayer is so simple. Children do it effortlessly, right? But prayer can also be so profound that there's not a earthly language for some of it scripture teaches it's hard we don't know how to do it maybe or we're afraid to start and let me tell you this is not a new problem this isn't just happening to us humanity as a whole has struggled with the concept of praying pretty much our whole time i heard this fiery brimstone preacher Leonard Ravenhill on youtube and he was talking about how the disciples literally heard the greatest pe- preacher there ever was Can you imagine hearing what Jesus sounded like when he preached? There would be no higher level of ability to communicate his own gospel than Jesus himself. And they heard this, right? The disciples heard this for three years. It doesn't say that they ever asked Jesus how to preach or how to teach. They didn't ask him that, but they did ask Jesus how to pray. Luke 11, 11. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished 
one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. This isn't a new problem. We've, we've all been struggling with this idea of prayer. I do want to say that um, we are in the re return series for prayer, and we have been having prayer gatherings um, once a month. Sarah and, and Joanna Gajewski started it. It's from 7 to 8 on Thursdays. And if I can't convince just a few of you to show up to that this Thursday, I'm a terrible preacher. Because I'm, I'm, I'm fixing to go that way, and I want you to really contemplate your prayer life, pr prayer life and the concept of gathering with believers and praying. There's many reasons why we don't pray many. I just want to go through a few of them and tell me, you don't have to tell me out loud, but let's see if any of this resonates with you. Why don't we pray? I feel like we are not sure. One of the main reasons we don't pray is we're not sure God really is hearing the prayers. If I were to come up here and tell all of you, guess what? Last night God gave me special revelation, something you have never heard. Are you ready for this? God hears your prayers and receives all of them. I doubt anyone in this room is going to stand up and go, wait, what? Did, did, did he say God hears my prayers, all of them? Oh, my God, I've never heard this before. I'm going to start praying four hours a day because he hears everything that I pray. No, we know we should pray, but why are we not praying? Maybe we're just not sure that he actually does. One of my uh, close family friend, has a, uh, one of their teenagers went through something last year uh, just so all of you that are older than teenagers, they communicate weird, uh, really weird. They, you know, Snapchat, you've heard of it. Um, they, so they, uh, my basic understanding is you can send a snap to someone and then they have to open it, I guess, maybe like an email or something, you know? Um, I'm a complete novice on this. But I just, here's the story. So one of my family friends, this teen, had, was telling their mother, his mother, that he had sent a snap to somebody. And he was devastated because apparently you can see that when they open it and this person completely ignored it, never opened it. And it hurt his feelings so bad because he just was like, God, you, you don't care about me even enough to even click it. He was devastated. And I wonder if, has you ever felt like your prayers are like that? Like, are they even getting to the throne? Like, are they a snap? God, are you getting my snaps? Are you getting my mail? Are they, are they reaching you? Do you even hear these prayers and petitions and requests that I'm making? Have you ever felt that way? Like I'm praying and, 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 and this nothing's, I'm, not, I'm, I'm perceiving that God is not listening, that he's silent. I've pray, I'm, I'm going to make a confession to you. Just not that long ago, I was praying for a loved one, and Sarah will tell you, I was praying intensely, I swear, like dedicating prayer for breakthroughs for this specific loved one, and it seemed like the more that I prayed, the worse things got for this person. And I told Sarah, I said, what's the point of praying? I just feel like it's, maybe I should just stop. God's not hearing it. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. It can't be God, right? God is infallible. So it's not on his end. It's got to be my end. I'm doing something wrong. It's me. So we're not sure that he hears. And, and when he doesn't seem to be hearing we assume that it's something wrong with us, right? It's my sin. It's got to be my sin. I must have done something wrong. I'm too much sin. I, I haven't been toting the line, the Christian line. I haven't behaving, behaved the way I'm supposed to as a Jesus follower. It's my guilt. It's my shame. There's no way he's hearing me. It's, I deserve this perceived, perceived silence. I deserve this perceived unanswered prayer because of what I've done. I told you guys this from the beginning. I'm not an expert in prayer. But I can say in full assurance that God most definitely hears our prayers. And Scripture teaches this truth very, very clearly. Most of the questions, our deep, hardest questions about prayer are all found at or on the cross. I'm going to show you a couple of them. So Jesus is hanging on the cross, right? Between two thieves. One of them is mocking him and the other one it's telling the other guy, stop. Now remember, they didn't just crucify people then. This guy deserved his cross. He didn't live the life of a Christian. He didn't tote the line. He didn't show up. He wasn't giving to the poor. He was a bad man. The Romans crucified bad men, murderers, rapists, fill in the blank. He deserved his death. He did not 
ever do what he was supposed to do in the eyes of God. And here he is hanging next to Jesus. And he prays, prays one of the most simple prayers ever been launched. Oh, he says, Luke 24, 42, then he said, Jesus, remember me. God, you just want him to remember you sometimes. Remember me in your kingdom. Now, let me tell you, Jesus is hanging on the cross. If there was an, ever a time where he gets a free pass to ignore a prayer, it's now. Like, he's literally taking on all the sins of humanity, right? The wrath of God is fixing to be poured onto his shoulders. He's going to drink this cup for all of us. This would be like, all right, listen, this guy's prayer, I can't answer it right now. I've got a lot on my plate, right? Jesus' response. Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. He hears every prayer. If he can hear this guy's prayer in that moment, then he can hear all of my prayers. And some of you cynics, I'm a, I can be very cynical in this room, are saying, well, that's great, preacher guy Dave. Um, everybody prays to God when the plane is on fire and it's about to crash. Everyone yells, help God, when the plane's about to hit the ground. We are, that's... That's this guy. He's on his deathbed. The plane's hitting the ground. It's over. But what about now? What about my life now? I've got things that I need him to come through with, and it feels like he, he's not. I'm not on my deathbed, but I need him to come through. I, I need God to come close. I'm not feeling him. I'm not hearing him. I'm not seeing him. He's not answering my prayer. Dude, there was this one time. Uh, when I was like five years into being a fireman, I was, it's probably, the, I was in like le legit depression. Uh, I was just struggling with a lot of things. I was like five or six into, five or six years into being a fireman. I made my first promotion and things were just so tough. And those first, it, for me, nothing was bad. We just had some, some financial troubles we were working through and all the, this stuff with so many kids. And I had some other income I'd lost that I was doing, and just being a dad, this felt like the weight of the world was on me, and it's like praying, 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 and I just wasn't getting answers, and I was down, really down, and those first few years, you would tra they would send firemen all, you would work wherever there was a hole, and I worked, there's 60 plus fire stations in Jacksonville, and I had worked all over the place, and uh, we, we like to decorate our helmets, some of us, and I had put this Z on one of my reflectors on the back of my helmet, and uh, during the process of years of going around, they get burnt, they get beat up in the back of the trucks. My Z fell off. And I was, I remember being so bummed that the Z sticker came off because that was mine, you know, like I put that on there. And I remember I looked for it, looked for it all over the back of Engine 50 and I, I never could find it. Years passed. I'm talking five plus years since that sticker came off the back of my helmet. And here I, I, I'm a get a, I get a promotion to engineer and they send me this little station on Pearl Street that's just two people in it me and another guy. I didn't want to work there. It wasn't my spot. There was no fire. There was just two guys. And I, it was like, this is where God is sending me. And I was just down, man. I was so, it's like, I almost gave up praying, you know? So they send me this station. It was rescue 15. And uh, I go and I take my gear and I'm, I'm out there and I'm, I'm putting my stuff on the thing. And I over in the corner of this, this station is old, this old crappy old place. The rescue barely fits inside it. In the corner, it's dirty in there, and I see something shiny, and I walk over, and I get down, and I pick it up, and it's the Z off my helmet. And I had prayed. I drove down Martin Luther King praying that God would just come to me and show me, answer me somehow, and I found that Z within 30 minutes of that prayer. It's like nothing changed. I still had these issues, but it was like he came to me and said, I'm hearing your prayers. And maybe you've experienced something where you feel like he's silent. You've asked for healing and, it's, you, and he hasn't. You've, you've asked God for peace for your, your child or from anxiety or depression or ADHD and things just get worse. It's not getting better. You've asked God for a baby and he hasn't given you a baby. Fill in the blank. Whatever you experienced or have been experiencing now, fill in the blank. What, what do you do when it feels like God is not answering you, that he's forgotten you, that he's rejected you? you that he's abandoned you because that's what happens next right we don't really sure he's hearing 
then we blame ourselves for him not hearing, and then we decide, he's just forgotten me. He's rejected me. Let me tell you, I'm 41 years old. I have found no person so far in this life that has not experienced this feeling of feeling forgotten and abandoned or that feeling of God's not hearing me. He's not coming through for me. He's not coming through. He's not coming through. The more we stay in that place, what happens a lot of times it turns to anger, right? Now we're angry, so I can't pray angry. And then what happens, we get so angry, we end up blaming God. This, this, you are the root. You are the source, God, to all of these problems. You are doing this to me. Well, now what are we supposed to do? We definitely can't pray when we're angry and we're mad at God and we're blaming him for all of our problems, right? Let me tell you something. Sometimes your most angry prayers are your best prayers. It's all over scripture. It's all over Psalms. I'm just going to read you one, but you can, go, you can go find it yourself. Sometimes being angry, I can tell you this. If you're angry, don't not pray. You should most definitely pray if you're angry. Read Psalm 88 with me. I'm only going to read this one because it's so extreme. Verse 14, why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am and in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. This is right out of the pages of the Bible. Now, a lot of people think that David wrote all the psalms. David did not write this psalm. The person that wrote this psalm is a guy named Heman the Ezraite, which is spelled H-E-M-A-N, which I translate into He-Man. <laughs> Any He-Man? I'm 41. I loved He-Man. Please, someone raise your hand and tell me you like, yeah, we have the power. God, I loved it when I was a kid. I can still remember getting all the He-Man toys as a child. Like, I remember my mom got really mad at me because I went searching and she bought me like the castle and I found it and like she was not good at hiding it. It was in, on top of the washing machine. I'm like, great time. I'm like seven years old. Like, oh, found it, mom. Good hiding spot. And she was upset. But I mean, I loved it. I, can, I have this specific memory, you know, in your shower has a different settings and you can, like shoot it on straight stream. Just stand in the shower like, oh, and, like, oh, I have the pallor. Like imagine Skeletor's just hitting me with his lightning and I'm like, you can't stop it, which is a little bit weird um, because He-Man is like, Wears underwear, he's like a glorified, he's like Ric Flair, uh, WWF now, but back then he was like, well, I guess it would have been cool if he man was like, woo, you know? That's Ric Flair if you don't know it. Um, here's the thing, I love taking showers too, so I'd be in there forever. And I still do to this day, like, I, I build an outdoor shower for surfing and everything, and I thought the kids would use it now most exclusively. I, I'm out there. And I'll be out there forever, outside. The kids think it's so weird. They're like, what is he doing out there? And now I'm talking about prayer. I'm like, maybe I should be praying in here. Nope. Straight stream. Ah! Just alone. They, I like taking showers because no one will bother you there. There's two places they won't bother dad. Shower and you figure out the other one. Bathroom humor. <laughs> but He-Man, He-Man is how you actually pronounce it. Do you know what that name means in Hebrew? Faithful. Faithful. This is the least faithful prayer I've ever heard in my life. He-Man is not being faithful. He-Man is supposed to be strong, right? Invincible. He just calls out and he gets power from on high. This is the weakest He-Man ever. Like he is completely lost faith and has blamed God for all his problems, but I got to give it to He-Man. He's still praying. Listen to who this guy was. He was the great grandson or the actual grandson of Samuel the prophet. He was related to the, one of the most powerful prophets in the Old Testament. And David assigned him and three other priests as the ministers of music of Israel. He was one of the top worship leaders of the nation. And you know King David was a worshiper. This was a big part of their culture. Surely this guy, God is hearing him. He's related to Samuel. He's the worship leader of the nation. He's buddies with King David. Surely God would hear his prayers, right? Yet you find him declaring darkness being his only friend. Listen, this feeling of not hearing God and feeling rejected and feeling angry with him when things don't come through is not a new experience. And I will say this, God does hear your, 
your prayers. He hears your sorrow. He hears your frustrations. He hears your anger. In fact, it's, it's prophesied. There was a plan for it. The cross did so much more than just take away my sins. Remember that incomparable riches of his grace? How he seats us in the heavenly places. He puts it at the table with him. Look at this. Psalm 22, I want, to, you to, I want to read this, and I want you to imagine all the millions of human beings that have prayed words just like this over, over the last several thousand years. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Every single one of those prayers always made it to the throne. Let's go back to the cross, Matthew 27, 46. So many of our answers to prayer lie on that cross with Jesus. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He quoted Psalm 22, right? He was absorbing it. He did, yes, we get that Jesus died on a cross from our sins, but the grace of God is so much bigger than that. He's never, never one, one tear has ever been forgotten from God. He was absorbed, the exchange was happening. He knew that we would experience in this life and he wanted to absorb it into himself with the cross. There is nothing that Jesus cannot do and has not worried about you and longed to bring you out of. This is who he is, this is what he's like. This is the beauty for ashes, right? That was happening. It feels like all we have is ashes. We cry out and it's like the angrier we get, it's just the more they just feel like it's falling through our hands. Bring those ashes and put them at the foot of the cross. Just keep bringing, keep praying. Build it up as high as you want. Make a mountain of your ashes. It just all feels ruined, God. You're not coming. You're not coming, but go to the cross. Build a mountain of your angry ashes, and he will climb up it. There is nothing that will stop of the love of God. We have been saved by grace. The incomparable riches of his grace. You think God can't handle your angry prayers? If he can endure the cross for you and for me, there's, you can go to him with anything. Bring your angry prayers to the Lord. Psalm 56 says, you know, Gerald talked about God's going to make all things new, right? He's going to wipe the, waves, the tears from our faces. Psalm 56, this isn't in my notes, but David prays. He literally says, you keep track of all my sorrows. Every one of my tears is in your bottle." You have a record of them in your book. He knows. He hears. I don't know why things don't happen right away when we pray, but I know that when we pray, he hears, as Scripture says, and that he longs for us to come close to him. Now, we've gone through a bunch of easy reasons why we don't pray, and I think I've made a case just from a few simple Scriptures on why we should pray. We should pray. Pray. Pray when it's good. Pray when it's bad, but pray. Pray. Pursue prayer. This is a call to prayer. Return to prayer. Seek the Lord in prayer. If you haven't heard anything I've said today, pray. I'm telling you, always pray. Always pray and go to Jesus in your prayers. Derek taught last week that from Scripture how worship is a weapon and a means of grace. If worship is a weapon here in Ephesians, it shows how prayer, or actually it's in Philippians. I put the wrong thing in my notes. Um, it shows how prayer is a shield. I want to read this with you guys. Is it on the screen yet? Philippians, there we go. It says, now watch this. This is where prayer becomes a shield. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, when? When things are good, when they're bad, when you're angry, when he's not coming through, when he feels silent, when he feels far away, when things are struggling, when? In every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, bring your requests to God, present your request to God. What will happen? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus. When we pray peace, like a shield comes, and God himself says that he will guard us. What, what is peace for us Christians? It's a person, right? Right? Jesus is the prince of peace. He rules over peace. So it says that when we pray, when we come, when we bring our requests, that he himself guards us. And I think this is where the problem lies, that too many of us Christians, we're still living like Adam and Eve in the garden. 
We're hiding from God out of fear. We're trying to, we're trying to cover up our own, our own mistakes, our shame, our sin, and we're staying away from him when he longs for us to come to him, and we're hiding away. But within Christ, when he reaches, us, reaches down and puts us at the table, we don't have to hide from God anymore. We can hide behind God and let him guard us. Before we feared him because he was powerful and the consequences of our sin, now because of the cross of Christ, we, we have the ability to hide behind him because nothing is greater and more powerful than him. We got to pray, guys. Our lives are now hidden with Christ in God, Scripture says. So our staff here was praying on Wednesday. Um, uh, yeah, we were worshiping and praying. We're super awesome at this Christian stuff here at OCC. But yeah, we were all in there praying. It was a sweet time. We do it, we do it pretty regularly. And uh, I just want to brag on Leslie Walsh a little bit. She, she uh, pretty much runs this whole place, and we barely made it without her for eight weeks when she was on maternity leave. Um, but if you've never been around her, just her prayers have inspired, just being around her when she prays, her prayers have inspired me. She has this amazing... Uh, the best way to say it is like this deep sense of gratitude when she prays, but like raw honesty at the same time. I've been, I've been challenged by just the way she prays so many times. But we were in prayer, and then she, it, we were all in a circle in the dark and just you know, quietly uh, contemplating Jesus and what he does. And uh, she had this vision of her life. She just had a baby. She's got baby James, brand new, and she's got two little girls. And she said she just saw herself running around her house, new young mom and has, working and taking care of the home. And she, there's just so much going on. And she was anxious, and she's trying to fix this and take care of that and make sure the baby has this and get dinner going. And, and she said she just feels like she's bouncing around the house, fixing things, doing things. And she said always that that's, she'll be going through the kitchen, and Aaron will like be in there and try to grab her and like hug her because he knows her, right? And she literally said in her, in her, in her prayer that she hated when he did that. <laughs> but he's a good husband. Aaron knows her. He knows that she, he just needs to stop her and hold her and just cover her with peace for a minute, right? And she's, she literally said that in the prayer, this was so profound to me. She said, um, I don't have time for this. Aaron, I don't have time for this. Is that not what we do to God? God, we're like running around him. He's like, all he wants to do is just come to me. Come to me. I want to guard you. I want to guard your mind. I want to guard your heart. I want to, I want to be close to you. I want you to spend time with me. And what do we do? We just dart around him. We're busy. We're, we're busy doing our thing, and we, we don't have time for prayer. We don't have time to go to him. We're not sure it's going to matter, and all he wants us to do is to come to him in prayer, Right? Here's the other thing about prayer. We instinctively know it's going to cost us something if we do it. We're going to have to give something up. We're going to have to give up some time. We're going to have to give up some sleep. We're probably going to have to give up some vices. That one hurts. Prayer is going to cost us something. We've got to make time for Jesus. How do you, how do you pray? You know, I can't come up here and talk about returning to pray, pray, prayer and not give some kind of idea on how you pray. How do you go to God? Repentance. But here's the thing. Repentance is not just a form of prayer. It is the disposition of prayer. It's the, it literally means you just keep going back and you go, keep going back and keep going back and back. and you, you got away and you come back to God over and over and over. Use repentance as your starting place. If you're in this room and I, you're like, I just don't really know how to do that? Use scripture. Use scripture. I don't know the right words. One of my favorite, uh, my favorite scriptures that I, I pray is in Psalm 51 where, where David says, create in me a clean heart. I'll be driving to the fire station and I don't feel like praying. I'm tired and it's going to be a long day and I just say those words like they've become my words some days. I just, God, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. God, do not cast me from your presence. Don't take your spirit from me. Just start saying them like they're your words. Restore unto me, God, the joy of my salvation. And let me ask you this as we close. Do we believe God is here this morning? It says when two or three gather in his name, he's in the midst. The scripture not 
I mean, there's a million scriptures on prayer I could have went to, but does scripture not say to, to lay hands on each other, lay hands on the sick, declare together in faith that God heals and saves? Is he here? God, let's seek him in prayer. Let's come up here if we need it and ask for prayer. Let's believe that Jesus wants this, that he longs to give us that peace like a shield. Would you stand? Father God, we worship you. And we thank you, God, that you can do anything. But God, sometimes you feel far away. Jesus, sometimes it feels like we're just casting our our line into the ocean of grace and we're just not connecting with you, God. Would you connect with us today? Would you come to us, God? Would you stir our hearts? May we feel you. May we know you. May May we declare together that you alone can save. You're the only thing that can save, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.